From the Alvin and Rosalie Sarachek Studio, PBS Kansas presents Kansas Week. Unions are gaining new strength as the balance of power in the workplace shifts. Plus, from advanced balloting to the role your county election officer plays in voter turnout, voting rights are making headlines. But first, July 1st means new rules for Kansas, from abortion to gender choices and who plays school sports. Yet there's a question on if the state will enforce all these new laws. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. This is Kansas Week, and I'm your host, Pilar Pedraza. Many of Kansas' new laws passed during the legislative session take effect this Saturday. But before the ink was even dry, we saw shots fired in a battle over enforcement of some of them between the governor and the attorney general. This latest fight centers around enforcement of the state's new Women's Bill of Rights, which supporters say defines what it means to legally be a woman in Kansas, at least so far as places like public restrooms, locker rooms, and shelters. In the run-up to this law, SB 180 taking effect, the Associated Press reports four times as many Kansans changed their gender on birth certificates and driver's licenses. Monday, Attorney General Chris Kobach announced they would all be changed back because of this new law. Quote, state records must be accurate and reflect the truth as defined in state law. A birth certificate is a record of what happened at the moment a baby came out of the womb. That baby weighed a specific amount and was a specific sex, Kobach said. Similarly, a driver's license is a state document reflecting a state database for state purposes. It is not a canvas on which a person can paint one's expression and preferences. Thursday, the governor fired back, announcing she'd issued a directive to state agencies to keep allowing the gender alterations. While my administration and the attorney general's office have had many conversations about the law, KDHE and KDOR disagree about its impacts on their operations and will instead keep in place their policies regarding gender markers on birth certificates and driver's licenses, Kelly said in a written statement. Kobach quickly responded, saying he would see her in court. Taking effect Saturday also include a ban on transgender athletes in state-sponsored school sports, a requirement for doctors to provide life-saving care to any infant born alive after an attempted abortion, also a restriction on investing state retirement funds in companies that use so-called environmental, social, and governance factors in their investments, and permission for homeschool and private students to play sports on their local public sports teams. Then there are the laws already facing lawsuits and on hold for the moment. Joining us to discuss all of this today, we have State Representative Jason Probst, a Democrat from Hutchinson, and political scientist Dr. Russell Arbin Fox from Fringe University. A quick note, we did have a Republican lined up, as we always try to have both a Democrat and a Republican. Unfortunately, we lost her due to technical difficulties. We will reschedule her for another time on the show. So, talking about the new laws going into effect July 1st, and this big fight between the governor and the attorney general, any surprises from either of you on that? There's no real surprise for me. I mean, Chris Kobach ran with the idea that he was going to sue somebody, mostly Joe Biden, every day. Um, so the idea that he's going to take something into litigation is unsurprising. What really is unfortunate to me, and I think for most of Kansas, is that we're going to end up in expensive, costly, lengthy litigation on some of these things that, large, that aren't like the pressing issues for most Kansans. This isn't, these aren't table issues, these aren't family issues, and actually you could argue that what that law does is violates the primacy of individual families, and we're going to end up litigating that, and it's really unfortunate. It's interesting that you mention, uh, you know, uh, Kobach's promise, yeah. you know, his campaign promise to, you know, uh, go after the Biden administration because at least some aspects of this law are, of, of these laws that are being challenged are going to be tied up with federal statutes. I mean, there are national laws that are relevant to uh, the operation of the census, that are relevant to the operation of the Department of Education, that are relevant to a lot of existing programs on a national level that affect things like, you know, what is written on your birth certificate, what is written on your driver's license, and arguments about uh, changing gender identification have been made all the way up into the halls of Congress, and they've been hammered out on the federal level. So if Kobach is really determined to you know, fight some of these laws, and right now he's fighting Governor Kelly about these laws, it's likely that at least in some is, in, 
instances, he's going to get his wish to go after the Biden administration because he's not going to be able to avoid that. This is going to be tied up in federal court. At least some aspects of it are inevitably going to be. Oh. And in fact, we we're already seeing similar laws in other states going through the federal court system and being knocked down time and time again. Yeah, it's a, I mean, we're, we're going we're gonna to learn again. Chris Kobach is going to learn again, as he's learned in previous years, <laughs> about the primacy of the federal government on some of these things. He, he has a sketchy track record on thinking that he can insulate the state of Kansas and, and not follow federal law, and he's been found to be wrong on that a number of times. There's a lot of ways in which states have, you know, pretty successfully pushed the uh, exceptions that they've uh, insisted upon in the face of national sovereignty. And there's a lot of ways in which that's still being worked out, especially when it comes to, you know, things pertaining to law enforcement, obviously, you know, disputes about uh, the legalization of marijuana, which is still on the federal level, you know, a, you know, a, uh, a banned substance. Uh, but you know, you, you know, you see next door in Colorado and in other states all sorts of differences. But when it comes to how citizens are actually recorded and the sorts of things that citizens are able to do on the basis of that recorded information, the federal government has really traditionally maintained a pretty tight control mm -hmm. over that. And so I, I don't think his track record is likely to change uh, in making some of these fights. So outside of this fight, there are a number of other laws that are coming onto the books starting on Saturday. What, Jason, you were involved in passing many of them and not trying not to pass others. <laughs> what do you see as the most important ones coming to realization on Saturday? Well, there, there's a lot. And, then, and to be fair, there are some good things, too, that will come in, and, and those don't often get all the attention. But I think, uh, I think this uh, issue around identification and gender is probably going to be the thing that has the most impact on a personal level for the people that it affects, but also uh, legally for the state of Kansas. Mm -hmm. What about you, Russell? Um, you know, obviously people are, are taking a look at uh, what the state legislature, you know, has, has tried to do in connection with uh, abortion and, and people remember well the, uh, you know, the August vote last year and of course Governor Kelly's actions, uh, you know, to sustain vetoes in order to, you know, maintain the kind of policy that she thinks is appropriate for the state there. I, I think a lot of people are going to be holding their breath just to see how this will play out. The transgender athlete ban, I mean, as you were pointing out before, considering the huge amount of attention it received, uh, we're talking about a very, very small number of people. And in a lot of cases, uh, you know, these are not people that are fighting really, really high profile fights. They're fighting fights that mainly are between parents and coaches and and maybe uh, school principals. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, some of the people who made a really, really big deal about fighting for this Women's Bill of Rights find to their consternation that, you know, out in various towns in Kansas, uh, you're going to have volleyball coaches and and middle school principals who are sitting down with some you know poor kid and saying to themselves you know we're just going to keep this on the down low yeah. and if no parents on the team are complaining they may find that uh enforcement is is not as clean and easy as they imagine it'll be well especially considering there is no enforcement in the bills so <laughs> well, look, I, mean, I mean yeah what i mean i guess they're expecting citizen reporting to, yeah. to make it happen. Yeah. One of the things I think you touched on that's really important is we are, when it, particularly when it comes to the, the women's sports bill, th there are very few, I think we talked last session that there were two or maybe three transgender athletes. We are spending an inordinate amount of time on this to, to affect uh, a policy around a, a, few, a handful of people to make life kind of hard for them. Uh, but we're opening the state up to a lot of risk on that. And I just, I think it's unfortunate that we went after that so hard when there were local rules in place. Keisha has uh, mechanisms to deal with that. Local school boards have the authority to do that. We have all these small government people in, in, in theory who then put a big government solution to a small problem in place. There's going to be some other aspects to the law where I think that there's going to be just some fairly straightforward 
rule changes. You're going to see a lot more gender neutral bathrooms yeah. being built. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that shift is going to take place, you know, throughout the corporate world, uh, throughout, uh, you know, the municipal world. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I think that there's going to be relatively little controversy over that. It's going to be, okay, this is how we respond yeah. to what mm -hmm. happens in Topeka. Unfortunately, some of these other aspects, there's not going to be, you know, as easy a resolution. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, from the Supreme Court to your local election office, your voting rights have been front and center this week. The Kansas Supreme Court announced this week it will review parts of a voting rights lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of a 2021 law that limits absentee or advanced balloting. Among other restrictions, one person can no longer deliver more than 10 advanced voting ballots for other voters. Opponents say this is rooted in election fraud conspiracy theories about ballot harvesting. They're asking the state's highest court to put a hold on these provisions as the case makes its way through the courts. The state legislature can't willy-nilly just make an observed claim of fraud, pass a law that will disenfranchise a bunch of folks and have that be okay, said Davis Hammett with Loud Light, one of the groups involved in the case. The state really needs to carefully craft solutions to address a real problem. They can't just make it harder to vote based on conspiracy. For two years, the League of Women Voters of Kansas has halted our core work of voter assistance because our state law targets voter assistance organizations with criminal penalties, said Martha Pint, president of the League of Women Voters of Kansas. Meanwhile, the ACLU of Kansas released a report this week identifying a link between barriers such as fewer polling places or limited office hours for advanced voting and participation in elections. The Kansas Reflector says the report focuses on the power of county election officials to determine how to run an election and the wild variations in those decisions from one county to the next. Overall, the ACLU says voter participation in Kansas declined by more than five percentage points from 55.76 percent of registered voters casting a ballot in the 2018 general election to 50.5 percent showing up for the 2022 general election. Love them or hate them. I think the numbers are kind of surprising for a lot of people. Very interesting because I know I would have expected at least to see a bump in 2020, if not 2022. And according to that, we had, still had a drop in participation. I found that very surprising. Well, we already knew that 2022 was below a lot of people's expectations, though not dramatically below. A, a lot of the reports about voter turnout, both within the state and nationally have been very much in flux uh, over the last uh, couple of election cycles. Uh, in regards to you know, what the state Supreme Court may do and, and more broadly how we're going to handle these kinds of disputes, I, it might be a bit of a stretch, but I would point to a decision, uh, an actually kind of surprising decision, that was handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court in response to what is popularly referred to as the independent state legislature theory. The basic idea was that a lot of arguments uh, pertaining to access to the ballot have ended up in state courts. And the argument was that states can pass laws controlling ballot access, uh, controlling uh, you know, timelines for mailing out uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 mail-in ballots and, and, and so forth, and that they're the final word. They're not subject to what state courts might have to say. Oh, well, the Supreme Court slapped that down, saying, no, uh, these laws are subject to the same procedures and protections that are built into our constitutional system. So even if that Supreme Court decision never directly becomes relevant to any of the fights that will take place before our state Supreme Court, I'm sure they're going to be keeping it in mind because they're going to be able to say to themselves, um, there is, if people try to jump this over to the federal level as opposed to leaving it on the state level, support for us being able to say no on the basis of the state constitution. This is the way we interpret the citizens' right to have access to the ballot, and we're going to be able to judge these laws accordingly. So I, I'm pretty hopeful that you're going to see the state's Supreme Court being fairly active in reviewing these and issuing some pretty broad opinions whether or not they meet with the state constitution. Not something that will endear them much to uh, many of your brethren in the state legislature though. Yeah, I just, you know, when it comes to these uh, changes in voting laws, I, I always want to say it would be uh, 
uh, laughable if it wasn't so dangerous to democracy. We live in a state in which Republicans control the supermajority of the legislature. They, we always elect Republicans uh, almost unilaterally to the, to the Congress, and we always vote for a Republican president, and yet they insist every session on coming up with new ways to restrict access to voting. And I think that it, that is telling, that we, we know how the votes go, but we allow a, a unfounded and unproven, and there's no data to support that there was any tampering with voting in the state of Kansas at all, that there's any fraud in the state, but we are expending an inordinate amount of resources. We're in the process of doing a legislative post audit right now uh, that has taken the better part of a year because we're not satisfied with the evidence that is shown that there's not fraud in our elections. Uh, I think it's really dangerous, and I think it's one of the biggest myths that's been put on the state of Kansas and across the nation, actually. The elections are secure. Kansas does a very fine job for the most part. And uh, I think we should be working more towards e expanding access and ease of voting and getting away from this uh, kind of fairy tale that somehow Republicans keep winning in a state that has terrible voter fraud. And I do want to point out that uh, no evidence that you're talking about, that comes from the Secretary of State's office run by Scott Schwab, a Republican. Yeah. So it's not a Democratic I mean, determination. I mean, he got into the job and he was able to look at the actual data. Yeah. He was able to read the actual reports. And the question was, you know, do I get on the Trump Kobach crazy train or do I report what the people who have really looked at this have to say? And what they've had to say is Kansas's elections are very secure. The drop off boxes are very secure. Uh, Mail-in ballots, I mean, they're handled in a very, very secure way. I mean, the amount of voter fraud in Kansas is utterly minuscule, which is really the same way it is across most of the United States. Frankly, the United States collectively has spent decades for, you know, they've spent a very long time trying to make these procedures work because people take voting very seriously. Mm -hmm. And the fact that over the last six to eight years, a lot of people have been captivated by the idea that the system is somehow fundamentally flawed and corrupt is just very strange. All right. Well, a mysterious white powder inside scores of envelopes sent to Republican lawmakers and officials in at least three states started with Kansas. Investigators have determined the powder was harmless, but say it could still get someone killed. Tony Mativi, director of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, led what he called an unprecedented investigation when more than 100 envelopes containing a white powder and a threatening note were discovered sent to Kansas lawmakers. In an interview with ABC News, Mativi described how for four days the Kansas Bureau of Investigation was forced to focus nearly all of its resources on responding to the letters. We just don't know at the early stages how much of a threat it is. We have no choice, Mativi said. At one point, every single bomb squad and every single hazmat unit in the state of Kansas, whether federal, state, or local, was dealing with this case, Mativi said. This was a massive resource drain. According to Mativi, his agency was stretched so thin responding to the letters, it was unable to intercept a substantial shipment of fentanyl the agents knew was coming. We have no idea how many overdoses and deaths are going to take place when we had a realistic likelihood of being able to intercept that shipment in the first place, Mativi said of the missed fentanyl bust. This threat, it was not harmless, Mativi said. After more letters were sent to officials in Tennessee and Montana and even to Donald Trump, according to federal officials, the FBI took over the case. And that's what we know about the case at this point. Uh, a lot of your colleagues getting these letters, I spoke to several of them, some very shaken by it. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's kind of an, an example of where we are in our political rhetoric, and I think it's, it's shameful. Uh, I vehemently disagree with a lot of people on a lot of things, but we have to maintain some civility, we have to maintain some ability to talk to each other, and we can't devolve into this sort of fear-mongering and threatening and uh, attacking people in a very physical way when we disagree with them. It's not going to solve any problems. It makes things worse. It puts more fear out into the world. And I think that's just on balance bad for all of us and it's bad for democracy. And this seems to be a tactic that uh, some dissidents of various different levels have been using since the early 2000s. I mean, obviously you can look back and find different examples of this. I actually appreciate the fact that 
uh, you know, Jason is, is, you know, thinking about this very, you know, realistically and soberly about, you know, what it represents, because I, I confess, and, and this probably does not speak well of me, was, you know, when I first heard the story, the first thing I thought about was just how frustrating it is that some depressed yokel in uh, a basement somewhere who decides to send out a couple of hundred letters as a gag is able to completely tie up uh, the Kansas Bureau of Investigations. I mean, I mean, we need to recognize that it is a reflection of pathologies that have become way too widespread. Uh, but I mean, even with that, I mean, it's there is the reality that you're going to have, you know, some YouTube jokester or something like that who thinks, oh, because of these pathologies, I'm going to be able to mess with people. Um, of course, until the FBI finds something, we won't know what the mm -hmm. real story is one way or another. Yep. Well, and the work that went into this so it was so meticulous, because uh, I know, again, a couple of lawmakers that I spoke with that got these, they had as return addresses like their local churches and stuff like that. I mean, they really, whoever sent these, really put some research into it. Yeah, and it, and the, and you know, the KBI mentioned that it was a resource drain, and that's another unfortunate thing. And when when things like this happen, and we have to redirect resources uh, to address a, a problem that is born out of pathology, uh, I think it's really uh, it, it, it affects a lot of things. And I just think it's a, to me, it's very sad, and I wish that. Um, we'd find more constructive ways to deal with our disagreements, but, um, but I'm glad that at this point that it's, uh, at least the powder has proven to be uh, harmless and, and that nobody was harmed in this. Yeah. And we kind of have some idea, the presumption is that whoever sent these will be caught eventually. And we saw with the, um, the swatting incident in Wichita that took an innocent man's life, mm -hmm. that there are laws that are in place that can be used to prosecute and these are federal felonies. All right. I mean that's a really interesting parallel because again it kind of it, it picks up on my maybe you know irresponsible idea that you know we need to think about this as a jokester as opposed to somebody who's you know engaged in some kind of low-level act of uh, essentially you know male terrorism or something like that. We do have laws that recognize that even people that are just looking to mess with people's minds can cause terrible if consequences because you're going to have law enforcement that's going to be responding to these as if they might really be like, you know, it might be, you know, a, a, you know, as uh, uh, Director Matavi was saying, you know, every single hazmat suit, every single uh, uh, bomb investigative team was activated. They're going to be responding to this with that level of seriousness and people have been caught in the crossfire. Innocent mm -hmm. people have been hurt uh, in these sorts of things. So yeah, this is something that whatever the motivation of the people or person behind it, it can be ramped up pretty quickly. All right. Well, if you hadn't noticed, organized labor or union activity is on the rise again in Wichita and across Kansas. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says union membership in Kansas grew by 0.6% from 2021 to 2022. Nationwide, membership grew by about 273,000 people in that same time. Now, those may not seem like very big numbers until you see them playing out on the streets and in the headlines like we did in Wichita this week. This isn't really new for Wichita. But this hey, ho, ho, greedy healthcare's got to go is a little unusual. Two different unions picketing two different companies across the metro on the same day. It's a surge we've seen building over the last year or so as Wichita firefighters battled for a better contract and Starbucks employees unionized for the first time. This is actually a healthy thing. The market is actually solving its own problem. It's a tide Dr. Jeremy Hill at Wichita State said began growing before the pandemic. Where all of a sudden we could see that workers were getting really frustrated with where the conditions were. We had this declining middle income class. And a shrinking workforce facing increasing demands for output. In other words, they had employers over a barrel. They could demand better pay and benefits and get them. Labor. This is kind of their time to play a little bit stronger hand. Dr. Larry Straub at Newman University and Dr. Hill agree that the pandemic accelerated this process. Pilar, I will tell you this, I don't think you can count all of the ways that's going to continue to impact 
the economy, our socioeconomic climate. The factors at play? The worker shortage. The pandemic, which our experts say changed Kansans' priorities. I think in some ways it might have even rewired our brains and our frameworks and the way we view the world, the way we view life in general. And it's playing out in the workplace. And a turnover in the generations at the negotiating table as baby boomers exit the workplace and Gen Z and the alpha generation make their voices heard. They're a lot more engaged and a lot more active and they're going to be the captains of their own destiny. A destiny that's not always shaped by money. There's so many other elements that are nuanced in the decisions that workers can have today. Decisions more and more are making at the union hall and now on the picket line. And this is something that, at least from my perspective, I've seen growing for a while as I talk to folks on the street, more and more discontent with that financial separation between companies, managers, et cetera, and the worker doing the grunt work, basically. Jeremy Hill saying, from speaking with companies, saying this is suddenly happening. Where is that disconnect? Well. I mean, what Dr. Hill and Dr. Straub have said is, is absolutely right. You have large macroeconomic demographic changes. Uh, a lot of it was tied up with the pandemic, but you also have, uh, you know, generational shifts. You have, uh, you know, a shrinking labor pool. You have all of these different things that are contributing to make organizing and demanding uh, better conditions, better pay from one's employers more possible. But let's also keep in mind, and this goes to your point, Pilar, that this sort of mentality has been building for a while. Maybe you really didn't begin to see the macroeconomic uh, changes uh, bubble up above the surface until recently, but you've had within the Democratic Party major shifts over the last five, ten years, particularly associated with uh, the, uh, the candidacy of Bernie Sanders, but uh, other elements as well, really trying to put the idea of worker empowerment, trying to put the idea of the legitimacy of unionization back before the American people. We're not back to you know the 1960s and the 1970s yet, but I do think that there have been some long building changes in the way people think about these struggles. And within the last two, three years, all of a sudden it's kind of broke the surface. And I, th I think, you know, we've had 50 years of uh, being told that if you keep making rich people richer, that it somehow makes not rich people richer. And it's been proven untrue. And I think people have had about enough of it. All right. Well, and that's going to be enough of Kansas Week for this week Thank because you. we are out of time. Thank you both, Russell and Jason, for joining us. And we hope you've enjoyed our discussion. We'd also like to thank our news partners at the Wichita Eagle, KSN News, and Cake News for sharing their materials with us. For now, stay safe and have a great week.